Hey guys, it's Cass. Welcome back to my channel. I am hopping on here to start a little project that I want to embark on. I don't know if this is going to be considered like a vlog or view. It's kind of going to be a combination of a bunch of different things, I think. But I did a poll on my community tab and asked you guys if you would like to see some like deep dives into certain books. So instead of like a reading vlog where I'm reading a bunch of different things, it would be kind of a vlog and like really in-depth thoughts about just one book. And the overwhelming majority of you were into that idea. So <laughs> we're gonna kick that off today. Before we get into all that though, if you are new here and you're into literary fiction, essay collections, memoirs, and things of that nature, please consider subscribing and leaving a comment. I respond to every single comment that I get. I love chatting about the books that I read with you guys and I always just have such a fun time talking to you. So yeah, um, consider joining the the little community that we have here. The book that we're going to be talking about in this video is Art Monsters, Unruly Bodies in Feminist Art by Lauren Elkin. I got this out from my library and I am about, I think like 20, 25 pages in so far. I'm going to read you guys the synopsis of this just so we know what we're getting into here. What kind of art does a monster make, and what if monster is a verb? Noun or a verb, the idea is a dare, to overwhelm limits, to invent our own definitions of beauty. In this dazzlingly original reassessment of women's stories, bodies, and art, Lauren Elkin, the celebrated author of Flanus, explores the ways in which feminist artists have taken up the challenge of their work, and how they not only react against the patriarchy, but define their own aesthetic aims. How do we tell the truth about our experiences as bodies? What is the language? What are the materials that we need to transcribe them? And what are the unique questions facing those engaged with female bodies, queer bodies, sick bodies, racialized bodies? Engaged with a rich genealogy of work across the literary and artistic landscape, Elkin makes daring links between disparate points of reference. And then there's a big list of some books and authors and talks about how this is like cultural criticism as well. So yeah, I'm super excited about this. Just from the first like piece that I read in here, it seems like it's going to be very thought provoking. The introduction to the book is called The Slash and in it she basically just talks about how the different parts of the book and like even just different sections within a piece are separated by a forward slash mark and she's really just getting into kind of how the slash both fractures and separates things but it also connects them and relates them to each other so that was just like a super short introduction to it and then the first actual piece in here is called angels and monsters in this she unpacks virginia wolf's idea of the angel in the house which is kind of this like self-sacrificing really sympathetic woman who understands that you as a woman making art have to almost kind of play the game and make art that men approve of in order to be successful especially in the time that Virginia Woolf was writing so she kind of unpacks that idea she gets into the title of the book art monsters and kind of where she got that from which it actually comes from Jenny Offal's book Department of Speculation which I haven't read yet I think I have Weather by Jenny Offal on my TBR shelf haven't gotten to that either but yeah this term kind of comes up in that book and there's not really any sort of basis that Lauren Elkin can find on Google for it I think maybe it appears in like French but there's not really any English connotation to it. And the actual quote from Department of Speculation is, my plan was to never get married, I was going to be an art monster instead. And she kind of comes to the conclusion that being an art monster is kind of renouncing the mundane, you know, family life, children, domestic work, things like that. And she mentions Doris Lessing, Sylvia Plath, and Anne Sexton as kind of examples of women that did that and kind of became art monsters so yeah she kind of gets into 
how women have denounced that angel in the house that Virginia Woolf was talking about, but she questions what stops women from creating art even after they have gotten over that angel in the house kind of on their shoulder telling them like you have to make things that men will like <laughs> and the main thing that she finds with that is that there's this like internalized self-censorship when talking about the body that we kind of face and she gives a really interesting example of a video and like performance artist her name is Carolee Schneeman and she talks about some really interesting pieces in here that ironically kind of going along with the theme of the book are probably not acceptable for me to talk about on here but if you're interested in some really thought-provoking kind of radical feminist art I would definitely suggest looking her up there's a lot of quotes from Carolee about how women are usually the like subjects of art so whenever they become makers of art it's kind of this challenge to the norm and they're kind of not playing by the rules of this really like male dominated art world the last part of the piece kind of goes into the definition of monster which is interesting because it gives us a lot of different interpretations and like potential origins of the word and it just talks about how a lot of the time the idea of monster is someone who is othered and a lot of the times women have kind of had to grapple with being othered typically we deal with that by either leaning into beauty and kind of playing into the expectations or we go the opposite way and really lean into like the ugly parts but Lauren Elkin talks about how that kind of reinforces the whole idea of monstrosity because it's centering the concept that the patriarchy has given us and kind of the ideal of the woman. There's also a part in here, I believe from Kathy Acker, where it was from one of her books and she's talking about this like blob <laughs> and kind of how maybe monstrosity is this like accumulation and this like excess and choosing both beauty and ugliness and not choosing between them and really leaning into either side. It's kind of having it all. So yeah, I'm enjoying this so far. I feel like this is the kind of nonfiction that is right up my alley. I'm loving all of the different artistic and literary references in here and I'm curious to see kind of where it goes. I do think that the writing is pretty accessible and like easy to understand so it's nothing super crazy um so yeah I will be continuing with this and I'll let you know my thoughts on the next couple pieces in a little bit hey guys just wanted to hop on here and talk about the two essays that I read last night in art monsters the first one was called carry that weight and it starts out talking about Emma Solkowitz who was a college student who carried her mattress around her college campus, I believe it was at Columbia University, in order to protest her rapist still being in school and attending classes, even though he had been accused by multiple women. That piece was really about kind of taking up space and owning the things that happen to you and just kind of being large and expanding and yeah, just taking up space in the world and with your art. Um, obviously with a mattress, that's a really big thing to be carrying around, much like the kind of mental and emotional weight that Emma was carrying. So yeah, she also talks about the artist Rebecca Horn, who has a piece that I looked up because of this book that I thought was really cool. It's called touching the walls with both hands simultaneously, and I'll put it up on the screen here. It kind of feeds into that same idea of taking up space with these kind of like bodily extension sculpture pieces. I just thought that the art looked super interesting and really emphasized the point that Elkin was making in this section. She then kind of talks about the first person perspective and how it's very politically urgent and kind of the whole concept of making the personal political 
and how it's super important for people whose experiences aren't universal and for people who aren't in power to kind of take ownership of that eye and share their experiences. There's also a phrase in this that I really like. She calls it the spectacle of female storytelling and she kind of talks about how women sharing their stories can be really powerful as a tool to organize and kind of realize the shared experiences that we have but it can also kind of be weaponized against us. She talked about a couple of different court cases and how the women that were kind of defending themselves in those had to be calm and collected in order to be believed. But sometimes, even if you kind of do everything right and act the way that society wants you to act, it's still not enough and you're still not believed. She then talks about the rise of performance art and the way that it expresses um, emotions and experiences that words can't. I can't tell if this is kind of moving through chronological order throughout time or not. She's kind of jumping around. Initially, I thought that it was going to be like this chronological look at artists. I feel like we're talking a lot about like the 70s right now and like the early 80s, but she also pulls in a lot of like more recent stuff like the Carry That Weight project. Another thing that I wanted to kind of just point out is that so far Lauren Elkin has been kind of amplifying queer and trans voices. She's referencing people of color and stuff. Um, I feel like a lot of books that deal with this subject can often skew very white and cis focused. So I do appreciate that she is referencing perspectives and experiences that aren't her own. I feel like she hasn't really taken a super deep dive into any specific like art made by these artists but she is pulling in some smaller examples so i'm curious to see where she goes with that i hope that she continues to pull in those perspectives and diversify the anecdotes and examples that are in here the other piece that i read last night was called the hand touch sensibility which was not my favorite just because i feel like it was a bit more difficult to grasp what she was getting at and like what the underlying point of the essay was. She talks about how in the 70s and 80s a lot of women really turned away from beauty in art as a rejection of the patriarchy, as a way to kind of claim their own authority as makers of art and not just subjects, which I feel like we kind of discussed a little bit in one of the earlier pieces. She kind of goes into talking about like this certain feeling that art gives you and just kind of like I guess different tactile things that I don't know I just felt like some of the ideas weren't fully thought out from start to finish and just it didn't really connect in my brain. I thought that the art pieces that she was talking about were interesting and I could see their similarities. A lot of them actually reminded me of the this is why album cover from Paramore's newest album. I just didn't feel like I was fully grasping these kind of ideas. She was talking about the abject and kind of just like transgressing certain boundaries and it was like I got it but I didn't at the same time. I don't know if this is going to be a vlog in the sense that there's going to be like clips of me doing other things. Um, I don't have a ton going on right now and I don't really want to make it any longer than it needs to be so it might just be kind of going from clip to clip of me talking. It has been quite a while since I jumped on here. I feel very out of practice. Um, I ended up putting art monsters down for a little while. I don't know. I don't know why. Well actually that's a lie. I do. I feel like I was putting a lot of unnecessary pressure on myself to make this into like I don't know some just like super in-depth like just complete breakdown of the ideas in this book. I don't know why I was trying to make this into that because that's not what I do. It's probably not necessarily what you're here for and like there's just so much in this book that 
like you have to read it if you want the entire rundown. So I don't know why I thought that I was gonna just like read this and completely break everything down for you. Especially because like this is my first time really reading like an art book. You know, a lot of the books that I read deal with art in some capacity, but they're not going this in depth into different artists and like history and different pieces. So yeah, this is more of like an experiment for me than like some like academic <laughs> scholarly project. <laughs> so I think I was putting too much pressure on myself and that made me not want to pick up the book because I was like, if I don't understand everything in here completely, like I can't, I can't talk about it, but that's, it's not the case. And I had read pretty close to like the end of the first part and then taken notes on it, but I never actually sat down to talk about it. I am in part two now, but of course my laptop is deciding to update and I need it to access my notes. So yeah, once that updates, I will share some interesting tidbits and things from the the chapters that I've read since the last time that I hopped on here but um yeah I'm not gonna put as much pressure on myself to like explain everything which is impossible to do anyway so the first chapter that I have notes written for that I haven't talked about yet is objects of vulgarity and I have tried to film a clip talking about this like three times and I am struggling because I read it a couple weeks ago. I do have the book here, but I'm just like not putting words in an order that makes sense to talk about this. One of the coherent ideas <laughs> and notes that I have written down is one that I don't think is super groundbreaking at this point, but she does talk about how we learn from society to feel disgust towards the body and like gross things. It's not something that is inherent or even like universal. One of the interesting things in the next piece though, which is slash aesthetics, she's talking about how in the 70s there was this kind of debate going on about whether or not you could walk into a museum and pick out the pieces that were made by women. She talks a lot about kind of female imagery and how women were kind of boxed into certain categories and certain subjects. And she does recognize that obviously our understanding of gender today is a lot more fluid than just a woman made this, a man made this. But I thought that that was an interesting thought exercise. She talks about how women artists are united by being outsiders and they've kind of inherited the language of the patriarchy. Like art is so male dominated so they're coming into it and kind of trying to work within that language and that framework by kind of having that idea of female imagery and putting women in those boxes it's really just reinforcing that language that they've inherited from the patriarchy the second to last chapter in part two was called on sensation and she this was a recent one for me I read this the other day, so she talks a lot about sentimentality and the definition of the word and like different uses of it and kind of how the meaning has evolved over time. She talks about the way that sentimentality is kind of looked down on and she talks about how we don't necessarily trust an opinion if it's only felt by one person but if it's kind of a mass thing and it's felt by a lot of people we also kind of have a negative connotation with that and we see it as this like mass culture not refined thing and how that often gets associated with femininity and just how feelings kind of link those things together like femininity mass culture and this idea of like sentimentality she also talks about susan sontag who i would like to read more of um i've only read her diaries the first volume of her diaries but one of the things that Susan Sontag had brought up in On Interpretation is whether or not content or form comes first whenever we're considering art, which I think is actually a very interesting question because 
I like to read a lot of books that kind of experiment with form and I, I think that that's a really interesting thing to think about. Like what is more important whenever we're looking at a piece of writing or a piece of art, like the structure that it's taking or kind of what it's actually saying and what it's about. Like it made me think about Alphabetical Diaries by Sheila Hetty just because the form of that is so different and just goes completely outside of any sort of narrative structure. Like you can't even really make sense of the content because of the form of it. So I don't know if <laughs> that makes any sense but in the last piece in part one uh is called on articulation which i'm not being very articulate right now i actually really enjoyed this chapter because lauren elkin is talking about the process of writing this book and she talks about the form of the book and how she got pregnant while she was kind of in the beginning of writing it and she had a lot of stops and starts with it so it kind of almost mirrored my my reading experience of it. Like I have been picking it up and kind of putting it down and stopping and starting. And she talks about how it's not necessarily in chronological order. It's kind of using the 70s as a midpoint. And then at some point she's looking forward into the future and she's looking backwards at other points, which makes a lot of sense because she brings up how people are influenced by others that came before them but also people that are creating at the same time as them and so it's kind of difficult to go in chronological order because everything's more of like this interconnected web of influence. She talks about Eva Hesse's work who I feel like I've been seeing a lot about her recently and her art recently. She kind of compares the book to Eva's art and how she's trying to link these like separate and like fragmented ideas and like make these connections between different artists and different art pieces and yeah I don't know I just <laughs> that chapter just made me feel so much better about putting the book down and like trying to pick it up and get back into it and just kind of reassured me that it wasn't just me not understanding things. And then we get into part two and the first piece in that is called the angel in the image and in that she's talking a lot about how throughout history men have been able to create art and focus on art because of all of the like unseen work that women do like taking care of children and taking care of the house and everything like that so much of that labor is like unacknowledged and it meant that they that women throughout history haven't had time to make art themselves. She talked a lot about Virginia Woolf's great aunt who was a photographer which I thought was really interesting. Her work is looking at Victorian values. The images were kind of these like idealized versions of the values at the time but the I guess the medium like the way that she was taking the photographs there was a lot of imperfections just like in the physical developing of them so there's kind of that juxtaposition between like these really uptight victorian values and these imperfections in the work she also went into like the history of needlework and embroidery a little bit which was interesting because i think a lot of the times it's looked at as like women's work like a women's craft kind of thing and in the beginning it was done by both men and women and then men kind of <laughs> turned it into a business and were like we're professionals it kind of left the women behind and relegated them to like amateur status it eventually kind of became looked at as a waste of time but since the men were making money off of it and stuff it wasn't it wasn't a waste of time for them i don't embroider or anything like that but i do knit and I think it's kind of interesting like looking at like arts versus what we consider to be crafts because a lot of the times those crafts are very intricate and like difficult to do and should be considered an art. The last chapter that I read was Sibyls and Slashers. The whole idea of Sibyls and Slashers is 
kind of decreating in order to create something. Um, so she talks about how a suffragette slashed a really famous painting of Venus and how that destruction, like if they had left it there and not repaired the painting, that adds something to the history and the piece itself. And I don't know, it's almost like the piece is kind of in conversation with, with that act. She also talks a lot about how women weren't able to draw the nude until like the late uh, 1800s. And since like hiring a model to like pose for you so that you could draw them was obviously expensive. Women a lot of the times would turn to self-portraiture because you didn't have to worry about paying for a model, but then that kind of brought up the whole issue of how you're presenting yourself. Obviously with a self-portrait you're presenting your physical form, but you're also presenting your, your skills in painting and you know, it was kind of a balancing act of like, you don't want to make yourself look too good because <laughs> then you're going to be seen as a threat. You don't want to cause, you know, any trouble with the the male artists of the time either. But it's like, you could do something, you know, risky and you could either, you know, get the glory from it or you could kind of live in infamy. Just kind of juggling all of these different aspects of how to just be an artist and just present your work. Howdy y'all. We're back. We're talking about art monsters. I have actually made some pretty good progress since the last time that I checked in. You know, I was feeling kind of I feel like just burnt out and like reading slumpy in general, but I have been sticking with it. I finished part two and started part three, so just gonna give some some quick thoughts. We had in part two, extreme times call for extreme heroines. This chapter was a lot about women artists of color and how they're kind of doubly discriminated against for being women and for being people of color. The main focus of that chapter was a handful of black feminist artists who really made a point of gathering and reusing objects, especially objects that had kind of racist connotations and history to them and kind of reclaiming those representations and using that in their art as a way to kind of confront those stereotypes. There's also the piece Difficult Conversations, which is also kind of dealing with race and ethnicity and this idea of like who gets to tell what story in art, you know, can you as a white artist tell the story of someone of color? You can't actually have that same experience yourself. It also talked about how certain stories and pieces and people in the art industry are amplified by the industry itself and like the institutions within it. There's also a piece called Get Out Your Steak Knives, Kali, which dealt a lot with Eurocentrism in art and the way that those representations are what is taught in art school. And I thought that those three pieces were um, really just like refreshing to see different artists represented um, from different backgrounds and things like that. I feel like a lot of the book has been focused on white artists, so it was nice to be exposed to some artists that I've never heard of um, who make really interesting work. The last piece in part two is called Let It Blaze, and that is really kind of deep diving into Three Guineas by Virginia Woolf. One of the interesting kind of ideas that I got from that was the connection between like abolitionist feminism and Virginia Woolf's ideas in that book. There's kind of a tie between the two. Virginia Woolf is talking about women's rights and war, power, and fascism in that piece. So yeah, there's just some like interesting kind of connections where she was kind of ahead of her time. And then we have part three, which I realized, I think it's called Bodies of Work, 
and it's called that because each of the chapters is spotlighting one artist in their body of work. I feel like I'm enjoying these pieces more just because there's more of like a through line and a focus on one artist instead of kind of trying to connect a lot of different pieces together. I think that it's interesting to look at the artists and how their work changed throughout time and just the, the connections between their pieces. I feel like the first piece in the section though, um, The Monster, The Body, is more so looking at literature and a couple different authors. It talks about Virginia Woolf, Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich. So there's a lot of writers mentioned in here that are of interest to me. Um, haven't necessarily read all of them, but definitely have them all on my TBR. One of the most like affecting and kind of jaw-dropping parts of this book so far for me was the portion in this chapter where she's talking about the Korean-American writer Teresa Hak Kyung Cha, who wrote Dick T, who, which I saw um, Biblio Sophie talk about recently, and it really piqued my interest in that book. But there's a really violent uh, end to uh, Cha's life, which I had no idea about. She goes into it a little bit in here. Um, I won't get into the details, but I did not know about that. But I feel like it really just drove home a lot of the points that this book is making and just the way that women's bodies aren't protected and have so much violence um, committed against them. The next chapter in the last section called Body Awareness looks at Maria Lasnig's journey. She was a painter um, who eventually got into like film and animation, which is an interesting trajectory. The most interesting part of this section for me was Lauren Elkin talking about how Maria Lasnig was really trying to paint the way that it felt to be in a body instead of just representing the body as it looks. So a lot of her drawings had kind of weird like proportions and colors and were kind of human-like but weren't 100% human because she wasn't trying to show you what a person looks like. She's trying to show you what it feels like to be a person. So I thought that, that was an interesting kind of connection between a lot of the works that she created. We have the chapter called Fuses, which talks about Carol Lee Schneeman, who I think I talked a little bit about in the beginning. This is like a deep dive into a film that she made called Fuses. And I think the central question of this chapter and of this piece is how can we appreciate the form of the work and the way that a work is structured when the content and like the images within it are really like intense and overpowering and maybe even a bit uncomfortable. And it's just looking at the way that form and content come together to create a piece of art and kind of become more than the sum of their parts. The last two chapters that I've read so far are called Her Body is a Problem and Vanitas, and both of these to me seem to be centering on the artist Hannah Wilk, especially the first one. She took a lot of self-portraits. A lot of people at the time kind of criticized her for almost playing into the male gaze with her photos, just like the style and the poses and the way that she looked in them. It really looked at a lot of this criticism being like feminists shouldn't show the female body in their artwork at all because it's just like upholding this classical perception of beauty. Second chapter, Vanitas also really talks about Hannah Wilk a lot, but I thought that this one was also it was maybe my favorite chapter in the book so far. It talks a lot about breast cancer, so it is kind of a difficult read. Lauren Elkin really connects a lot of different artists and writers that dealt with breast cancer, and I just think it was such an interesting subject matter to explore because of how it affects women's bodies, and Lauren Elkin is like looking at the connection between beauty and death in art and how they weave together. And yeah, it was it was a really tough but interesting part of this book.
Hey guys, it's me one last time. I finished editing this video up until this point at like 10.30 last night. I was so excited. I was like, okay, I did it. And then I realized that I just simply did not finish talking about the book. <laughs> So I'm gonna wrap this up super quickly. I have just a couple pieces left to talk about here. Um, the first one being Ucky, which talked a lot about Judith Scott, who was a fiber artist. And this really talked about the different textures. She did a lot of like layered pieces that had different um, like objects wrapped up within them and there's this picture of her like hugging one of her pieces so lauren elkin was talking about just like texture and the way that we look at the difference between craft and art and she kind of hypothesized that maybe the difference is that craft allows for touching but art does not she also looked at eva hesse in this again and just kind of the different ways that you can read her work based on her life. Um, she had a lot of trauma in her childhood and um, we're just kind of questioning here whether or not those wounds can be separated from her art and um, whether or not we can really like untangle those and see them separately. There's also The Nature of Fire which talks about Anna Mendieta who also had a really tragic ending to her life. We're just kind of exploring the question of whether or not knowing what happens in an artist's life changes the way that we look at their art. Kind of like, can you take from the future and use that as a lens to look at the art that they created? Which I think is an interesting question. Knowing what happens in the future definitely changes the way that you see things. Then we had Kathy Acker is my abject. This one was a weird one. I haven't read any Kathy Acker and uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to. And one of the things that I appreciated about this chapter was that Lauren Elkin kind of unpacked her own hesitations with Kathy Acker's work. She just is a very polarizing person and just from the the little excerpts that we got in this chapter I don't know that I would necessarily enjoy her work so that uh it it was it was interesting it was strange one of the things that I really liked though from this chapter is the way that she talked about how the people that we are citing in our work influences the way that our work is perceived because Kathy Acker was always like referencing these like really also polarizing like male writers and things like that and that definitely kind of framed the way that people see her work. This is literally like a speed run. <laughs> the next chapter is called Meet which talked about Helen Chadwick. Helen Chadwick was a photographer that really was like blurring the way that photography is typically like a representation of reality. She would use it in really unconventional ways. One of my favorite pieces that I found because of this book was called Ego Geometria Sum, where she put images of herself onto objects that had meaning in her life. There's one with like a piano and there's like it's literally a picture of her like playing it and it's I don't know how she put it on there but it's on the side of the piano which I thought that, that was just like a really interesting way to to use photography and then the last chapter in the book is called decreate to create this one talked a lot about childbirth and the way that that decreates women it's kind of this like undoing and this acknowledgement of making something that will eventually fail and decay even though that's really like unthinkable whenever you have a child. She talks a lot about motherhood in this one and how both motherhood and making art involve giving up a control of the outcome. Um, you know, once you have a kid or once you make art and put it out into the world, you, you don't have any control over what happens to it. And this one looked a lot at Vanessa Bell, who was Virginia Woolf's sister, who was a painter. And then the last little like outro section is called right after this one looks at Eva Hesse again 
um, and it compares the structure of the book to Eva's sculpture, which is called Right After, which I think I included a picture of earlier, um, but it's just like this big tangled web. I believe it was like fiberglass or something like that that was covered in latex and was just like super connected and drapey and stuff like that. Yeah, Lauren Elkin is just comparing uh, her book with that work. And that is that. This was a really interesting experience. I think both just because of the content of the book, but also as like a booktuber <laughs> trying to make a video. I definitely realized that there was a lot of unnecessary pressure that I was putting on myself, but also like it's hard to talk about <laughs> a book, especially a book like this that's talking about so many different people and artworks and just so many different themes it's it's tough to to sit down and really give coherent thoughts on it so i don't know if maybe a video like this would be better with a book that doesn't have as like broad of a focus or if it would be interesting to do with fiction like maybe like a reading vlog and review with spoilers i don't know it was a it was a challenge but i'm glad that i did it i think from editing the video yesterday. I feel like it turned out decently. <laughs> Hopefully it, it makes sense and gives you guys some things to think about. Um, maybe inspires you to pick up the book as well. I think that it is a really interesting kind of primer into feminist art, especially if you haven't really read any books that are super focused on it. So yeah, that is gonna be it. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!